We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, due to a last minute change in plans, we're going to host another live Q&A with the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. So, you guys can start sending in those questions right now. Now, as I mentioned at the top of the show, I had originally planned to talk about Next Step Games from Ticket to Ride tonight. And that topic actually grew from an interesting conversation we were having with our patrons on the Tabletop Bellhop Discord channel, which all of our patrons get access to. And if you were a patron, you could be there too. Now, Math Guy Dave asked if we'd ever talked about Next Step Games from mass market games. Like, have you ever talked about the Next Step from Monopoly or the Next Step from Sorry or whatever? And I mentioned how we did that for Catan, literally on our second podcast episode ever. So it was right when we got started. And I talked about how I liked first breaking down what people liked about Catan and then using that to offer up game suggestions. So then later in the same week, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, asked me on Facebook to recommend some next step train games from Ticket to Ride because he was considering picking up a birthday gift for a train game fan. So I thought this would be a perfect topic. So Sean and I... Sean from Hamilton, my podcast co-host, too many Sean's, uh, we're checking out the Puffing Billy website after the conversation on Discord, and we were looking at their list of train games, and I saw two games on that list that I have in my piles of shame and obligation, Great Western Trail and Rail Pass, and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, I, like those are, they're sitting right here, I can, well, one, I can't, actually, I can't see, I can see one of them, the other one we're going to actually open up at the after show tonight, if you stick around, um, so, and then I also got a copy of Irish Gage for my birthday, now, this may be second guess covering the topic tonight. It just makes sense to me to try these games first so that I can decide if they fit the topic or not. And I'm going to guess that one's going to fit, one's not. Like, I think Rail Pass is going to be a perfect next step game, but I'm pretty sure Great Western Trail probably <laughs> goes to a difficulty level more than a step above Trick to Ride. And I think Irish Gage is a step above that. But still, I want to try it. I want to, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm going to play Great Western Trail and go, you know what? If you played Catan and Ticket to Ride, you can pick this up. So we are going to get to that topic, but it's probably going to be at least one week, maybe two. It depends how long it's going to take for me to get those games played before I can fully talk about them. Now, I don't necessarily have to get the reviews out or anything, but I do want to play them each at least once. All right. Well, <clears throat> Roger in our chat room has asked yep. an interesting question, and he's, he's being a little self-effacing about it, but it actually is a reasonable question to ask. Okay. So, He's noticed that many of his game prototypes tend to send people running out the door and hiding under the table. It seems that the typical gamer has a real aversion to half-finished games and unsightly prototypes. Is this a common thing with board gamers, or is it just my games that are the problem? Well, Roger, I don't think it's just your games. No, I really don't. Definitely not. So a good example of this, right? Sean was here for this, so he'll, he'll be able to back me up on this. We're at Breakout Con, the first time we've gone to Breakout Con, and they are working with uh, Prototio. Is that what yep, they're called? Prototio. Yeah, Prototio, which is a Toronto-based, GTA-based, I shouldn't even say Toronto, GTA-based prototyping community all about getting new board games out to new people and helping new publishers and getting play tests and everything like that. A huge resource for people like Roger, people like you trying to get their games out there. They were outside the main gaming hall. They had eight to 10 tables, rough guess. Oh, I think they had more than that. The, I think they actually, I think they were actually up to like 12 or 16 even. Okay. So, so 12 or 16 yeah. tables versus the 200 in the big gaming hall. Yeah. The entire weekend, I maybe saw 30 people in that area checking it out. And they yeah. tended to be the same people trying different games. And you're right. Uh, gamers have a real aversion to half finished unsightly prototypes. No one wants to play. Like, part of the problem is, and we mentioned this on the show more a couple of years back than recently, the number of games that come out in a year are ridiculous now. There are a, a large number of games. Now, not talking about the time of COVID, I honestly don't know how many games came out in 2020 because there were lots of constraints there, but there was at least one year before uh, 2019, 5,000 games were released in one day the day of Essen. That's 5,000 new board games. These are complete. These aren't prototypes. These are finished, published, viable games you could bring home and play. And you only have so much time to play games in your life, right? If you're, you're a gamer hobby and you like playing games, you can only fit in so many games. And well, what of those 5,000 games should you play? And that's where people like us come in, right? Reviewers and board game geek ratings and lots of other things that kind of, and, and the hype train and Kickstarter and media and all that to try to get you to try those games. 
with 5,000 finished games out there, 500 of which are probably amazing games, why would I go play someone I don't know's half-finished prototype where I could play a finished game? Yeah. And, and that's a real thing. It's tough. I mean, especially, I almost think it was doing a disservice to Prototio where they placed them in mm -hmm. Breakout Con. In, in, on an initial surface way, it makes sense. Hey, all these people are going to walk Shuttles. by your tables to play board games. But that's the problem. They're walking past your table to play a fancy, nice, you know, $75 board game that they haven't got at home, but is in the library of games uh, available at Breakout Con. And that's in their mind, playing that nice, mm -hmm. big, meaty game that they're hoping for. And, and so seeing someone who, you know, may only just have index cards or, you know, strips of paper and, and dice is a tough sell for someone mm -hmm. who could be going in and playing brass or, you know, whatever, or whatever, whatever the new hotness uh, yeah. is, right. Uh, that, that year, the year we were there, it was planet, right. You get to play with this yes. awesome, great new hexagonal three dimensional shape, or you can go play with index cards. Um, now, personally, I actually was trying to get involved in prototyo. I really like doing prototyping. I think it's, I think it's fun. Um, what I have found is I don't actually enjoy online prototyping. Uh, mm -hmm. I do like sitting with a designer and talking about their game and, and, and playing with the pieces they've got and talking about ideas. Um, I have tried some online prototyping and I'm finding it not fulfilling that same thing for me. Uh, so I'm hoping maybe when, uh, you know, all this wonderful <laughs> mess is over, uh, I can go back because I had actually tried to get involved with ProtoTO and uh, as, a, as a prototyper. Mm -hmm. What I've found seems to work because i know game developers I've, I've got an indie game right here from one of our <laughs> friends this this is the the official published version because he couldn't sell it to a company so he went through drive through cards and i know what he's involved in and what tends to happen is you have to get a bunch of game developers together and you play test each other's games because yeah. for one it's a self-fulfilling prophecy right it's a closed loop it's a i'll play test your game you'll play test mine right you're both getting something out of it because another problem with playing people's pro player prototype games is it's a selfless act in a way, right? Like the, the gamer is not getting anything out of it except probably an incomplete experience <laughs> in, a, in a game that doesn't quite work, right? Compared to playing something that's tried and true and tested, whereas the prototyper is getting tons of feedback. So it, it's it's not as much of a two-way street, whereas if you are all game designers together, you've got that two-way street. And the problem is we're in Windsor, right? Windsor's not that big. I'm sure there are other, are other game designers out there, but I know Rogers reached out on Facebook and tried to meet others, and I just don't know if they're out there. And I think it's only really game designers that are interested in that, right? You have to have that that design gene, that that urge to make your own thing, or a really critical, I like giving feedback to people urge, right? And, one and of those two. And that one tends to be me, unfortunately. Yeah, that's what I was. Uh, so I, I think that has to be there. And I just think Windsor's too small, right? Yeah. Now, once things open up, I think there is a group that gets together in Michigan, in Detroit, but I'm not positive, right? So I, I think it's trying to find the group of people. Now in bigger cities, like I know all the Jamie Stabemeyers and I'm trying to think, there's a, there's a whole group of them out in the Seattle area, right? And they get together once a month. And these are people who do, like play games and publish games like Wingspan, right? Like big games. They all sit out and they, they sit and they share their games. It's, it's the, they, they, the, the rule is you can't show your game off unless you play tested so many other games. And I don't know right. the number. But it's like you have to sit there and go and play play tests with other people first. And only once you've done so many do you get your other one out. So yeah, Tax mentioned he knows of one other game designer in Windsor. Like technically I'm a game designer. I wrote some RPGs, but like it's, it's not my passion. I'm not about the game design. One, one of the other things you run into, and, and one of the things that Proto, Proto TO does is they run a, uh, well, there's a few things. They, they do run a game cafe night once a month uh, where they take over a uh, yeah. They take See, over a game big. cafe and they bring in you know it, it's a bunch of designers mostly playing each other's games, but anyone else who wants to drop by can. And then there's also Proto TO where the designers have to pay uh, I think it's like fifteen dollars or something to come in and show off their games, but players only have to show up and pay like five bucks to be able to play right. all the games they want. Um, because one of the things you run into I think with the game designers playing game designers games is game designers have a mindset which mm -hmm. isn't always the same as a player's mindset, yeah. right? And so uh, someone who doesn't 
care about design and just wants to play a good game. He's going to look at a game uh, with a different view and a different mm -hmm. uh, eye to the game in front of them. Um, so See, now the other thing too, you that wouldn't be the end of it. Like I realize Roger's still in the early testing stages right then. I think you're fine going with game designers, but don't stop. Like if you are involved in the group, you've got to get it blind play tested with the public and no blind. You can't be there. You can't be coaching. You can't be answering questions, right? Yeah. Like that, that's, that's the thing we find the most wrong with games, including one we're going to be talking about later today. Actually, I think one of the issues with the game we're going to review tonight is that it was kept in a small group of people who all got it and all understood it perfectly and didn't don't understand how people outside that group don't quite get it yep. and and that is a huge problem and that's a, that is the problem i can see with always playing with designers designers do have a different way of playing games and, and thinking about games and while anyone's willing to design games is usually willing to get into that nitty-gritty and they're going to prefer games that have that nitty-gritty right like they're, they're probably not there to play a variation on uno that plays quicker or you know uno with two new cards they're there to deep dive something and tear it apart yeah, like I know one of my one of my first actual game playtesting experiences was at QCC. Um, you were off playing a game, and someone uh, D and I sat down and played somebody's, um, you know, collect and deliver pirate themed game. Um, and it was it was a really it was they had a lot of work done on it, but it was interesting because there were some you know good questions that came up about mm -hmm. uh, you know about what the dice were doing and some variability questions. The game was getting there but it still had some of those questions and they clearly hadn't thought about those questions. Yep. It was, you know, well, you know, why is, why, why has D never failed anything ever in her, like, you know, yeah. yes, we know D is good at games, but there's something more to it here. And I think the dice in the fact were the problem that they hadn't thought about their percentages properly for mm -hmm. that or something, uh, something along those lines. I don't remember the exact details, but you know, and, and, you know, valuable help like that is just, you know, someone else, who plays things differently. You know, D has yep. a, a way of playing games and I have a way of playing games that are wildly divergent. Uh, and so we're both going to be able to find different holes or different strangeness in your mm -hmm. game versus those people who've played it from the beginning and have seen every variation of the rules you've ever tried yep. and know that, oh, well, I can't do that that thing anymore because you patched that up a while ago. Whereas I might try it anyway and see if it's, yeah. it, without knowing it was broken and or fixed. Or even worse, you play it the way you always have, and it ends up that rule got cut out, and you didn't realize that the rule got cut out. Yep. But of course, it's played that way because that's how we played it the whole time, right? So that's definitely a thing. Yep. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that really answers the question, except for the fact that yeah, it's definitely not you. It, it's definitely a bias, <laughs> and I have it right. Like I, I wish I could try Rogers games, but I have a pile of obligation and a pile of shame and a hundred games downstairs I haven't played yet, and. I have four hours tonight to do something. And I'll admit most of the time that ends up being watching TV because I'm burnt out from other stuff I've been doing all day. Right. And the other thing too is, is it's playing a prototype and there's more of an investment there. Right. For one, there's, there's a, there's a social investment, right? Like you are expecting feedback and I have to provide that. And I may not be comfortable doing that. Whereas if I go play a game in my basement and I hate it, I can just put it away. Whereas if I play Roger's game and I hate it, like it depends on your personality type. And for me, that's a mood thing. Like some days I'll totally tear into Roger's game and tell him, I don't know what you're trying to do here. This just doesn't work. Or I'll be like, you got something good here, but it needs work, which Roger's heard that advice from me. But other days I just don't have the spoons to do that. Right. Like it's emotionally taxing as well as intellectually taxing. Absolutely. And I have to say, I've, I've enjoyed sitting down with Roger and again, playing at the table with his uh, combat game and, and, you know, feeling those dice and seeing the, uh, the pieces in front of me and, and thinking about ideas, whether he has or hasn't. Yeah, Dan is pointing out, I do still have some feedback I need to give if the game does not play well. Uh, just tune into our last episode for that. I know that's different than talking to the person to their face, though. I, I would have a hard time talking to Dan Ackerman about Techlandia. I, I think. wouldn't. I, I'll, I'll sit down for a beer with Dan Ackerman any day. Yeah, see, I, I don't know. I, I have a feeling, though, based on that game, I still have a feeling that Dan totally knows that's, I, yeah, that's, 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 that's how his game of, is. I, Dan seems to me to be a cool enough guy that I would be able to sit yeah. and chat with him and ask him. I, I would actually love to ask him, okay, what did you yeah. realistically hear? Let's sit down, you yeah, know, person real to person, and, and where were you going with this game? Was there actually a bigger plan, or yeah. is this a is this as much of a joke as it ended up being? Sorry to say. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think I think our, our final answer for Roger is yes, it's normal. 
um, typical gamers do have an aversion to half finished games. And I, and, and to be honest, I think for a good reason, there's only going to be it like gamers are already a small subset. The amount of gamers who are willing to play other people's unfinished games is even smaller. And then the ones willing to give feedback doing that are even smaller than that. And the problem is we're, we're not, like you said, Rogers noted in the chat that he, he actually works with the Seattle group. And I actually wonder if it's the same one I was talking about earlier that has some rather big names in the industry who all play each other's games before they're published. Um, I, I, you need to find that community. You need to find a community of people and then you do the two-way street. You check out someone else's game and they check out yours or you go to now, uh, there was a good question in the chat asking if there was unpub in Canada. And I'm not sure if there literally I, is unpub, find, quote unquote. I couldn't find unpub. Um, it's pro I said, Proto TO is the big one yeah, in TO's Southwestern one. Ontario. Like, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe you start up, talk to Proto TO and see if they're willing to start up a local chapter in <laughs> Windsor. Proto uh, we we proto would have to be what it is for the our local branding we live in windsor essex so now everything's we something that started like i don't know about 10 20 years ago when the mayor pretended the super bowl was here when it was actually across the border everything became we so you'd have to have we proto would be the local community and see if you can get people to join it like yes i know you have your facebook group and you've got some interaction there but like do something formal and maybe be a subsector of proto to so that when pe people go to proto to it would point you to like, right. hey, if you're in Windsor, Emma Larkins is, yeah, Emma Larkins. That's the, exactly the group <laughs> I was go. thinking of in yep. Seattle. Emma's awesome. All right. Well, I think we Mercury on Twitter. I think we covered that M's. pretty, uh, pretty <laughs> thoroughly. So we'll do a little jump into a quick little one. Ryan asked, what is the oldest geek culture shirt you own and still wear? Oh, still wears rough. I still have my Warhammer Fantasy Battle Skaven t-shirt that I mail ordered from GW UK, but there is no way that is fitting on this bod <laughs> whatsoever. I still own it. Still wear? I, I don't know. Most of my shirts are still in, in rotation, but they're not that old. Do, yeah, it's upstairs in the bottom drawer in the left-hand side. Uh, I think the oldest one I still wear is probably my no place. There's no place like 127.0.0.1. Um, yeah, that one's good. Uh, which isn't that old but oh no it's... no it's fairly the choose your weapon the green choose your weapon with the d6 to the d20 and then i have a blue one that's the same thing but it's controllers though it's really out of date now like i think it ends at xbox one like xbox not right. xbox one <laughs> like the original xbox controller and it shows like a pong controller and a atari one there you go where is a ban that... bandana no no you need the skaven to show up right that's the whole point is you got to see the skaven over top of each other if I don't have that one, then I have the one with the knight who's knocking the jaw off a skeleton, which was on the cover of the first edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle. It's right. either, I have that one or the Skaven one. I can, I'm pretty sure it's the Skaven one, but I might have the other one still. Um, but still wear is probably those those Choose Your Weapon shirts, which go back to um, when uh, Jinx first opened. Right. Back when they had contests where you could win free shirts by sending in suggestions for shirts, and I sent yeah. them a ton. That's not where they came from, but I just I sent a bunch in hoping to get free shirts. Right. So I have that one, but that's... Um, I've got some anime ones that still might fit. Like, I have a Neon Genesis Evangelion shirt that may still fit, but I haven't tried. <laughs> um, it probably fit about a year ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, the pandemic has been rough for people in many ways. That may have fit a year ago. Um, th th that's my final answer. Uh, I'll go with the, the choose your weapon shirts. I, I can still pull those off. <laughs> I got to kind of stretch them a bit before I wear them in public. All right. Well, we had some questions that came in earlier as well from some of our uh, lobbyists in our uh, chat room on Discord. Yep. Jeff asked today, if you were a board game, which board game would you be? And he's, he's asking answer for answers from all three of us. That means you too, Angie Games. I think she, yep, she's actually paid. She's not doing something else right now. <laughs> so I was thinking, I saw this question earlier. I've been thinking about it. The, the answer is depressing. And I don't know if I want to share a depressing answer or not. So if you got something, go ahead. You know what? I've been struggling on, on this one. I, I haven't... Uh... I keep every once in a while I keep coming up with uh, silly funny funny answers, but a real honest answer. I a silly don't funny really answer know. might be good. The problem is my real honest answer is like self degrading, and I don't I don't know. <laughs> I'm break into tears while telling it because that's all I can come up with. So I was thinking I'm Splendor. 
see because when people first meet me they're like oh my god this guy's awesome and he's got all these board games and he's really cool and he knows all this stuff or i'm thinking about when i start a new job they're like wow this kid must have been gifted he's picking up things and getting on things twice as quick as everyone else but then like i'm not diagnosed with any of this but i swear i'm somewhere on the spectrum and my brain doesn't work quite right and then once these people accept me I then become too much. I push things too far. I, I don't stop. I just keep giving them more and more. Or I get too deeply involved or I take things too seriously or whatever it is. And those people that initially love me are just kind of like, nah, I've had a bit much of Mo. Like it was great at first, but he's pushing a little too hard and he's a little too close. Or he's a little too in my face or he won't shut up about a thing or he keeps showing up when he's not invited or just a little too much of him. And for that reason i think i'm splendor because when i got splendor i'm like man this game is awesome look at it, it's like this and then you play it enough times you're kind of like well okay yeah i get it I've, I've seen all the things you can do this game's okay why does everyone else want to keep playing it and then the more i play it the more i'm just kind of like yeah, yeah i'm kind of sick of splendor and every game night i go to there's someone who want to play splendor and then i go on here and they're like oh splendor and i'm here and today splendor's on board game arena i'm like oh enough with the splendor so yeah i think i'm splendor i think me i think i'm gloomhaven because I'm massively overweight, very complex, but nobody really knows what to do with it all once you get it out. I like that. That's pretty good. I'm working on the overweight thing again. Started working out again. I'm down a bit. Still waiting on Deanna's answer then. Yep. Yep. I got nothing. How can I follow that up? <laughs> all right. Apparently I apparently I broke D. So show that does not have manual decks. What game is that? I'm like you're a which way novel. There we go. <laughs> choose choose your own adventure board game. A choose, choose your own adventure game. A solo legacy dragon hole played solo. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, now I'm even more inside. No one disputed me being Splendor. So now I know I'm <laughs> Splendor and I'm probably pushing them too close and I'm getting too close and they're going to have to push me away soon. Luckily on the show, they can always just tune out on the weeks. Thing. That is true. I didn't realize I get such <laughs> we, deep and destructive answers. Yeah. That's um, the problem with it happening before I took a shower. That's right, literally the problem is I was taking a shower and that's what was running through my head. And I kept thinking about it and thinking about it. And I'm like, oh, I'm this. No, I'm this. No, I'm like, I'm talisman second edition with all the expansions, <laughs> but missing a couple of the metal miniatures. Cause I know so much stuff and there's just so much going on in the box, but it's all kind of nostalgia and it's all old stuff. And it's kind of irrelevant nowadays. But <laughs> So I was kind of leaning towards that one for a while until I came up with the splendor analogy. I figured oh. Sean had to say he was candy land, but oh, and, and figure out how he was going to tie the two together. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see if D comes up with an answer before we're done the show. We're going to jump over now to a question earlier from earlier on where from math guy, Dave, who's in the chat room. Uh, what are the main barriers keeping you from playing RPGs online? Mostly for you. Cause well, I do play online some. Uh, time commitment, time and commitment. That's, that's all it is. And, and pl I'll admit, I don't like playing online nearly as much as I like playing in person. I, I, I need that physical connection. I need to be able to look people in the eye. I need to see body language to really enjoy an RPG. And like we tried it on Discord, and it worked, right? Like Math Guy Day played in the game I ran and it worked well enough and I had a good time. Um, so I don't know, again, I'm going to get philosophical here, I guess. For one, it's a first step. It's taking that first step. It's one of those, you know, you're going to enjoy the thing, but you still don't want to do it. And then once you do it, you love it which for me was when I was a kid, it was scouts. I hated going to scouts. I didn't want to go to scouts. I pretend I got hurt or I, you know, whatever, pretend I'm sick. So I didn't want to go to scouts, but then my parents would drop me off at scouts and I would have a great time. They picked me up and I'd be like, it was awesome. But then next week it'd be like, Oh, I don't want to go to scouts. I hate scouts. It's that there's that aspect. There's that taking that first step to actually do it, but more so like, I don't, I, how am I, many weeks in a row now have I said, I'm going to do unboxing videos and I haven't gotten those in and how many times I'm like, I'm going to do RPG a month and I'm going to read one role playing game a month and do a review. And I said it after reviewing white star, I'm like, Oh, that was awesome. I loved reviewing white star. I need to do another one. I haven't done that. And it's not just like procrastination. It's just with what we do, doing this a full time and nothing being steady, right? We don't have any steady income. We're always got the next thing to do. There's always one more thing. There's always one more deal to share. There's always, I should be creating more pins on Pinterest to try to drive more web tra traffic, or I should be going back to our most popular posts and rewriting them and updating them, make sure the links are good. Like there's just always something to do. And then I push myself to the point where I'm so sick of it that I just, want, I'm out of spoons. I don't want to do anything. 
And I end up on the couch watching Netflix, right? Like we're working our way through, we're doing about three episodes of Deep Space Nine a night right now. For a while for me, that escape was Animal Crossing, but I haven't played that in 14 days. So right now I'm off that kick. Um, I had started Zelda Breath of the Wild, but I found it too stressful because it's just, it's, it's Zelda, it's difficult. So that wasn't a good one. One of the things I would honestly kind of love to do, uh, and it would take, unfortunately, the right group as well as other things. Uh, but you love playing the game. Like, you love running games. Yeah. Um, you really enjoy running games. But you don't want to have to deal with the fiddling. And you don't even want to really have to learn the fiddling setups that come with mm -hmm. online, right? Yes. So, you, you, again, you like miniature games. You, you mm -hmm. like miniatures in your RPGs. Uh, and all that stuff is available, but you've got oh, the learning curve, the learning yeah. curve to deal with. What I think would work for us is, um, and I keep considering it. I, I, I have, my finger has been hovering over the buy foundry button far too many times in the past <laughs> few months, but like literally I set up a game for you to run for people. Like I'm your, I'm your yeah. producer for an <laughs> RPG. Um, and it wouldn't even have to, I mean, we don't even have to do Twitch. I mean, we don't have to do live stream. That's a whole other level of production that we don't necessarily yeah, want to get into. Yeah, plus there's there's content issues. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, 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 I can sit down with the people at the table and we can do session zero and decide exactly what we want to hear. But that may not be what the viewers are comfortable with. That's like, I, I, I applaud anyone who live streams their RPGs and doesn't get in trouble. Yeah, right? no. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, things come out during games. and Absolutely. I, there, I, I, like, I, 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 would I don't know. I'm, I'm amazed. Like, even Critical Role's getting called on it. They made the small mistakes now and then, right? I, I would have a hard time putting myself out there on a, on a, on a Twitch RPG because I know my, some of my content goes blue and, yeah. you know, and, and I have some, unfortunately, social, 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 social racism aspects of me that I know are there and I have been working hard to get mm -hmm. out, but they come out, things, now things come out, right. You know, yeah. phrases that I learned as a kid and were drilled into me that I have since learned are, are really bad. But again, it's one of those things where I grew up saying that and had no idea what I was I'm saying. I'm not laughing at Sean noting racist. I'm just laughing at how deep we keep going. Like, like this is the like deep AMA <laughs> this week, the, the soul, yeah, searching soul searching AMA. AMA. But yeah, I think, I think it, the, the way we could best do it online would be all right. So Sundays from eight until midnight, we're gonna role play. Mo, this is the you know, death on the reek we're running, and yep. it will be set up for you when you sit down at the uh, yeah, at yeah. the computer, and all you have to do is run it, and you know everyone will have characters, and everyone uh, will have maybe. miniatures, and be able, we'll all be able to see it and do it. And I wouldn't be playing, and that would be what's hardest for me is because I well, want to yeah. play in one of your games. You'd think again. you could play too, though. But well, N no, nowadays cause... hidden information isn't what it used to be. Well, it sure. is if people take it seriously that sure. way. But something things I used to worry about, we wouldn't worry about. Yeah. So Jeff's noting a lot of streamers do the X card lines and veils. The thing is, you haven't done that with your audience, right. and that's what I don't like about live streaming a game. I play Warhammer, and I'm really into the realms of chaos, and I have Slaves to Darkness. And if I start using that content, that will offend some. There's a lot of body horror, even just, exactly. just body horror alone. That's in, like in I the... said, the body horror, <laughs> the describing the chaos waste and the chaos beastmen's, and there are, there are things that I am certain could easily offend a viewer. And if they don't know that's coming, right? I'm just as guilty as like. And, and the problem, I don't know, it, it'd be hard. Like, yes, you can list all the content yeah. warnings you want, but that's what I would be worried about. And the problem with Twitch is a lot. I mean, it's really easy to sit down and at the start of your session, have a, have a warning, you know, Hey, here's what we're doing this week. Here's our trigger warnings. This is what we're doing. Please but you don't, aware. if you're but playing then, to but discover what happens, in, someone can jump in to yeah. your show and they don't necessarily have that context anymore. It's not tough. even that too, but like when you start a session, you don't know what's going to happen. Right. Like unless you pre-record, but like doing it live on Twitch. Yeah. I can put out all the court content warnings in their thought, but then I didn't think huge was going to pull corn out his butt and people who play Warhammer might know what that means, but like <laughs> suddenly goes, yep. you know, over the yep. top with some torture porn or something, because yep. that was an aspect that if you got the God Slanish there, that's an aspect of the game. Yeah, you can record and edit for YouTube, not streaming it. I don't know. I, I don't plan on doing any live stream RPGs. Yeah, no, But I, as for playing online, like I said, time is the biggest. Like just, for, like, and a big part of that is learning the tools. Like 
even the one game we did run still like I spent four hours, I think at least just trying to do what I did do in roll 20, which was just a matter of creating player tokens. And I think we spent half an hour in game trying to figure out how to put plus one minus one to track how many bennies we had or whatever they were called in that game. Yeah. So yeah, the, the biggest thing that gets in the way is, is one time to play two commitment, right? Like one shots, one thing uh, as it is like we we're supposed to play a, a star Wars uh, online game on Thursdays. And I don't remember the last time we played it. Thankfully it's three people who are four people who are very blase about it anyway, except for the fact that should have never paid for a subscription and neither should, <laughs> should have D but that going, like we can't even keep that going. Right. Or heck we didn't record our podcast last week. Right. There's a commitment signing up for a game either, either as a player or a GM. And it's not the kind of thing like where a player's house where if, well, if one player doesn't show up, you just play. Well, if the DM doesn't show up, you get another DM. It's a little more difficult when it's when it, if I'm the one running and roller, Sean's doing the producer thing. If I can't run, we're out. Right. Like I can't have a backup GM for something like that. All right. So we've, uh, dug into that pretty seriously i think yeah again <laughs> we got any right. more deep questions <laughs> we got a question here from roger so now that we know which game you want to be what are your greatest pet peeves what drives you nuts at a game table uh, the biggest is people not paying attention if you're playing a serious game, like if you're playing Sushi Go and Seven Wonders and you know it's a beer and pretzel, everyone's having beers and someone's not paying attention, that's different. But if you're all sitting down to play Terraforming Mars and everyone's expecting you to play Terraforming Mars for three to four hours or however long it takes, and someone's, it, it, it could be their phone, it could be looking around the room, it could be we're at easy mode and they're watching some live stream of someone playing uh at Fortnite, or it could be getting up to get a drink and it, the the time when it gets to a player's turn and for one you have to remind them hey it's your turn and then they go oh, okay wait what's going on what happened since my last turn and they have no clue what they're doing they haven't pre-planned and yes i know some games that table state will change in between rounds enough that you can't plan ahead but most games you can usually be two or three turns ahead at least one turn ahead knowing where you're going to do stuff so to me, it's it's that lack of attention, and it drives me the absolute worst when it's I'm teaching the game, and and I teach them the rules, and there's someone not paying attention, and I can tell they're not paying attention. So I'm like, well, so you got that, Sean? So blah blah blah, and then we start playing, mm -hmm. and the first question is, oh wait, how's this work? And I'm just like, ooh. So for me, yeah, it's it's that. Um... Now Deanna has pointed out it's quarterbacking. She hates when anyone else tells her how to play there there is we bought a game she made me buy a game because some grognard at a con tried to make take her turn for her through the entire game and she made me buy it so we should bring it home so that she could play it herself without someone telling her what to do and i'll admit i think we played it once since then <laughs> so it probably wasn't a very good purchase but because this old white dude with a huge beard let everyone else take their turn but because it was a woman at the table had to oh no dearie you want to do this and oh no you wanted to do this no no you don't want to do that and i'm like here's the probably the best player at the table and he's trying to coach her on how to play yeah no that's that's and that's a, not even just a d problem that's a female gamer problem yeah. i'm sure for many many women at yeah the, so deanna uh, deanna clarified so there was someone trying to correct me when i make my move particularly if it's coming from a certain angle demographic which i was a little more specific yeah no absolutely uh you know what honestly i don't i don't know um i think you i thought you didn't like the super competitive players well yeah that there's that but I, that that's i mean yeah no i guess that's true uh, you know, if you're if you're there to like the, be the super, best, you know, I'm gonna I have to win a game. I and know, who get mad if you cut them off? Yeah, and, yeah, I have to I have to know the best strategy, and I ha yeah that that just yeah no I, that that's right. Yep, <laughs> I can't. Like there there is a local gamer who actually reached out to me again, who I banned from our events. Who I'm worrying I'm gonna have to reban once things get up, and I actually said please don't contact me again. Um, who was so serious about his games? What he would do was convince other players to play badly right? just so they could win. But all in the, the he's just giving friendly advice and he knows the game better than me. So people would listen to him and he would literally give bad advice. Like he would just say, no, no, you'd be better moving your army there. No, no, if you do just do that. And if you just do that, that'll give you 30 coins. 
And then you'd be like, then you, you do it. And they'd be like, ha, ha, ha. And then just go in and like tear you apart. And I'm like, right. no, you're metagaming. You're not winning the game because you're better at the game. You're winning the game because you're manipulating the players. Right. And it's not a social deduction game where you're supposed to manipulate the players, right? This was in Power Grid, right? They got my dad to actually get eliminated from the game in the beginning on purpose. He's like, no, if you spend all your money now, you'll get the better plant than everyone else. And my dad was out for the whole game and hated it. Even that was the one time I saw my dad get mad at one of our events. And I'm like, no, that, that is terrible. So yeah, but the, but the not paying attention for me, but like, I also, I'm not a big fan of the over, if you're playing a tournament, sure. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like if, it's, if there's something on tournament. the line <laughs> besides you're just playing for fun. Yeah, sure. But other than that, we're all here to sit and play a game and have fun. Yeah, I and I'll know, admit, I, I take some games reason. too seriously. I do. It can happen. I can be that person. You you can at times, but generally, I mean, most of the games we play, are, we're, we're still learning. So mm -hmm. so we don't have that problem because we're just trying to figure it all out. Um, the, the I think the, the most funny time I've ever seen you get that way was at the uh, FLGS playing Bean. Uh, and 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 you were super into the game, and no one else was. Yeah, everyone else was just like no, everyone cards. else was just playing cards and having fun and having a chat. And you were so frustrated and so angry because you were gonna win. You had the right strategy. You had the right. And, cards. and I'm like, oh, why you did you were give him that to card? Win, and we all just didn't care. And I mean, and it wasn't that I was trying not to care, but at the same time, the rest of the table hadn't cared, and it was very obvious that you were going to play. Bean. Yep. not just not just you know chat and have coffee and and and, ch and uh, goof around so ryan notes it's hard to be able to call someone and not paying attention when you can't see it which is true Absolutely. That, that's very true which is one of the things i don't like about online gaming yep uh no and that's one of the pro big problems i have with online gaming without video uh because again i do i do not quite play by post but you know just straight text and you never know when it's like, Oh, you know, all of a sudden you've been waiting on someone's response and they're like, Oh, sorry, I got called away. I had to go, you know, take garbage out. Yeah, or something. exactly. And you don't know, like you don't know if you should be working on another thread in the story or if you really should be waiting for person X to take their turn because you don't have that visual cues. And that's one of the, the, the really valuable aspects of the video. Um, even mm -hmm. though like in, meetings I, I hate doing video on zoom meetings most of the meetings i do thankfully uh we don't but uh it's it's one of those frustrations it's like i don't i want to i want to know when people are paying attention no makes sense all righty uh, all right we got time for at least one more or we could dive into this bottom thing uh you know what probably no, wrap let's... up with that but i'm thinking we're, we're gonna save this for next week yep yep all right, so one of the things we thought about talking to, about tonight was what makes a train game? But I, that may be our entire topic next week because the more Sean and I were discussing it before the show, the more we were thinking this could be bigger, right? Th yep. this, this could take some time. And I'm thinking we might do it completely unscripted and just have me and Sean shoot the, the, the stuff back and forth <laughs> about train games. So the I think we're both on the same episode. page. Yep. What we need, we need is someone who's a train game fan to come on and argue with us the the other side i think yeah, is what need... what'll be missing from that or, or maybe i'll just take the devil's advocate side and just start disagreeing yeah with you. <laughs> i i would be probably better off just agreeing but we do still have some questions from the chat or received earlier from people in the chat so that still counts absolutely so i'm gonna go with uh back to a uh jeff oh we actually you know what roger's got a game that had just popped up and i'm gonna go with that you like that one better all, all right. right i'm gonna i'm gonna go with that. we're saving jeff's for next month yeah, or yeah. next Absolutely. week or whatever just, we just do got some week. great questions we can use later so i want to throw this one because this is straight live from the chat room roger okay. asks does anyone take the time to really master a game anymore the games change so often how can a person even do this what games are we missing out on which might take a while to really get a hang of. And, you know, we talk about this whole one and done mm -hmm. gaming system all the time. So, yeah, this is definitely a thing. A thing with modern board games. This was not a big deal back in the year 2000 when games like Catan and like you could get 
the top 10 games and play them all. And they were the top for a reason. Like they really were like you could, uh, Tom Vassal used to say it well. He said back in the day when he started his podcast and his, his show where he, he was a vlog first, a YouTube vlog, he used to be able to play every hobby game that was released every year. Like, yes, he probably missed some small independent publishers, but in general, he would get to play every game that was released and he would highlight the best of them. Now that's impossible. Like, Literally, there are not enough hours in a year to play every game that was published. It's just, you can't do it. And that's in one year. So every year you're missing out on something. And then the next year you're missing out on more and the pile of games you didn't get to play just grows and grows. It is definitely a thing. Now, what I will say though, is there are people out there that master games, that sit there and master them. And this kind of goes to the train game topic is most of the people who listen to gaming podcasts are looking for a variety of views so they probably play a variety of games so most of us i'm going to use that term (laughs) are more of the new hotness try new games always play new games but there are people out there that still just play one game or a small handful of games or one system and there's definitely sub genres of gaming that stick to one type of game and the biggest of that are the chit hex encounter war gamers and historical miniature gamers to throw in um brian sheehan who's not with us tonight but to give him a shout out and the um train gamers right like looking at the 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 18xx like the heavy economic train gamers those are definitely subsets where that's all those people do and they love them and they play every 18xx that comes out and they'll get one with the difference because you can sell the stock one round sooner in this game and how much that changes the overall feel of the game there are people that deep dive games that much it's just not us now deanna is someone who would deep dive games more she loves playing the same game over and over and over and really mastering a game and we do do a lot of that but now it's online Like I would say at this point, we have deep dive Terra Mystica about as far as it can go. Like the only thing we should do now is get someone new in there just to mess with what we've been seeing the last (laughs) few games because that would totally change our strategy. I've now played every race in that game at least once, if not twice or three times at this point. I have favorites now. I want to get the expansion because that's not online, but I'd love to play with the expansion, see what that changes. Another example is Eminent Domain. Uh, We've talked about it on the show where that's a game that honestly, I think can be bad your first play and not so great your second play. But then once you played it four or five times, you start to learn how the decks work and what the tech are, then you can really enjoy the game. And the game's not good until you get to that point. So, and, and like, I know people who played Puerto Rico a hundred times. I played Race for the Galaxy 150 times. I, I definitely have deep dove that except eric who keeps saying if the games keeps picking random expansions and i never know which one's in and which one's not <laughs> and that's just me not spending enough time to figure out which ones are in which game but um, i definitely don't win every time so it, it happens there are people who take the time to master a game and i admit now and then i miss it like i i miss the like when i got back into hobby gaming Catan was the game we at the time Uh, We had an apartment in the west end of town. My parents lived in the west end of town and they were Canadian snowbirds and they would go down to Texas and we didn't house it, but we checked in on the house at least once a week. And what we do is we would go over there on the weekend and spend the night. And at some point in there, I got game magazine, which used to be published. I loved it. It was a magazine that was mostly crossword puzzles and stuff like that and logic puzzles and that. But they also had a section on video games and board games. And they would give out a Games 100 uh, top games of the year. And I went there and went, you know what? I'm going to take this magazine and whatever wins the number one spot, I'm going to go buy. And then I looked and it was Catan. And then I called Ian at Hugo and Immune. I'm like, do you have this game Catan? He's like, yeah, I got that game Catan. And at that time, it hasn't quite blown up. Like, this was just on the cusp of it blowing up. So we went there and we bought Catan. And we brought it home and we played it. And we drank a lot of beer. And we played it, I think, seven times in a row till about five in the morning. Then the next Saturday, we're like, hey, Ian, are there expansions for Catan? He's like, oh, yeah, sure enough. So then we got, I think it was Seafarers first. And then we played, I don't know how many times. Yeah, and we didn't know Ian. Ian wasn't like a friend at that point. He was just the guy that owned the local game store. And then I don't know how many times we played. Like, we we also drank a lot of beer because it was hanging out with Sean Skolak. Not Sean from... Oh, wait, that doesn't work. This is a whole other show. <laughs> Yet I another of the collected Sean's. 
yes i collect sean's and it would get so bad like it'd be so drunk that i would put cards on my forehead so i'd remember that i want to trade it the next turn but then i'd forget it and it'd be there between games and we'd be like two games later and i'd still have a weed on my head like it, it but we had so much fun and then the sister who actually isn't in the chat tonight um started joining us and then the group grew and then we got the five to six player expansions and like i don't know how many we probably played 300 games of Catan that summer or that winter i guess it would have been that winter and like we deep dived it and it was so fun like like everyone knew everyone else's strategy and you knew yeah <laughs> you didn't have to worry about skolak you just like he'll go pick somewhere in the corner you could adore him cut d off before she's able to just buy every stupid um what are they called i can't remember what those cards are called development cards don't let deanna get the spot where she just keeps buying development cards and we all had counter plays to play against each other it was definitely a thing so it happens and like we've done it but like there are certain games i play and i'm like this needs to be deep dived like eminent domain was one and i did it like we we still didn't deep 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 dive it but we gave that more plays than any other game just for the review purposes and it happens but it, it's as rare there's um highlander in windsor who sean made me remember for the bbs days his group still plays Catan. they came out to one night at the knights of columbus and i taught him to play Catan, and he gave me the biggest handshake ever for introducing him to something new and then they never showed up again and then I found out basically what he did was we taught him the game. Then he took that game back to his group that used to meet on Sundays in his backyard in his garage with folding tables. And they were all playing Catan. They still have Catan. Well, I don't know with COVID. As far as I know, that group still has Catan night. And that's what they do. They love Catan. You see this a lot more with role-playing games, uh, especially D&D. Uh, much to Jeff's chagrin, where people play one system and play it to death. And I'll admit, we were like that. We did that with Warhammer. We weren't interested in playing anything else for a long time. And then we eventually spread out. But even then, we were still like kind of stuck to the same D100-based systems. Like we played Chill, we played TSR Marvel. But you didn't play that. That was before then. Um, Warhammer, um, Cyberpunk 2020, which was D10-based. We tend to do D10 and D100 games more than D20 games. But we played those same games over and over. And meanwhile, there were new RPGs being released all the time. But we just know I don't need a new role playing game. I got D&D or I got or AD&D second edition or I've got Cyberpunk or I got Warhammer. So the people are out there, but there's definitely a big push for the new hotness, play the new hotness. And that's for content creators for sure. And we ignore it. <laughs> we don't really pay, pay attention to the new hotness unless someone contacts me and says, hey, do you want to review the new hotness? And then we review it. Or when I happen to attend a con and a virtual con nowadays and hear about the new hotness, I'll talk about it. But it's definitely not something you would do as often. One of the things I see, uh, and I see it on the side because it's not something I do. I'm not the guy who's going to master a game. I am not going to sit down and even games I've played to death. Um, you know, I play... What was uh, Go Sushi, Sushi Go I've played? I don't even know how many hundreds of games of now. Yeah. Um, that one I feel like I've, I've mastered because there's such a random aspect of it. But I feel pretty confident that if the right things come up, I'm going to be in the top two players. If the right cards don't come up, yeah, I lose. Yeah, whatever. Doesn't matter. Um, uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm getting better at uh, GT racing. Terra Mystica, mm -hmm. I still don't feel like that confident. With. But then again, I don't. <laughs> sit and analyze it as much i a lot of the playing i do is i do a lot of gut instinct playing which probably mm -hmm. drives mo a d in particular crazy more often than not yeah most but, of the time i don't even pay attention to who's playing what color <laughs> I, I i that's one problem i found playing online is i focus on my own stuff only i'm not good at watching what other people right. are doing uh, but uh no the tournaments on board game arena there are some serious tournaments. And I mean, I look at some of the people who play in uh, board game arena. Hope that way. <laughs> and, um, sorry. sorry. Uh, look, you look, there's these major tournaments that happen on board game arena uh, where people take it really seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people with like really high ratings of, of all on the games and things like that. And I look at these people and I'm like, my my good game ratings are like 200 250 yeah and you look at some of these people that are like 1300 mm -hmm. i'm like well okay you play that game a lot and, and really focus on it i'm not that interested in doing that but uh but they're there and those mm -hmm. are the people who are in there the other thing too is i honestly think game design has changed to be more ephemeral 
the games that are coming out now are lighter, quicker to the table, more replayable due to randomness to make them interesting instead of longer complex strategies. Now, those other games still come out, right? You still get your Anachronies, you still have your Terra Mysticas, you have your Twilight Imperiums, but the average popular board game nowadays, like Wingspan's the perfect example, is a pretty light game that there isn't anything to deep dive. Like, like the first time you play, you've kind of experienced everything. And yes, you might get better at it, but like there's nothing to play 50 times to learn a new strategy uh same with like azul even no matter how much we love azul like once you got it you kind of got it like there's 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 nothing much to deep dive it's not like chess where you're going to be figuring out strategies for hundreds of years it, it's not that's just the meat's not there now again that's where you get those other subsectors of games right there are those games out there there's the 18 xx's there's the the gmt games any pretty much anything published by gmt games you can deep dive but again what we call those is lifestyle games so a game that you are going to deep dive, we call a lifestyle game, and you end up playing that instead of other games for a significant portion of your life. Gloomhaven, I would say, is a lifestyle game just by how many scenarios are in it. Yep. And while we played pretty casually playing Fridays most of the time, there are people out there that managed to finish Gloomhaven in six months. And I'm just like, how many times a week did you play? How many sessions in a row did you play? Like, did you go through three missions a night? Like, I can't imagine doing that. <laughs> and that was back when I was gaming more often. But yeah, I mean, so, I'm looking right now, there are like 15 different tournaments open right now on BGA. Yeah, so whether you want, whether you want to play those. Kark or Hive or Innovation or Race for the Galaxy, uh, actually, there's a Rallyman GT tournament. I may there actually click on There you go. You it, might have to jump but, in. Uh, I got I to gotta check on the on the dates on that one. But uh, yeah, there's a ton of stuff. Yeah, like Rogers, Roger just pointed out a good one. It was his question. Niroshima Hex. That is definitely a game you could deep dive especially the idiosyncrasies from the different armies. Unfortunately for me, I have a copy of the game. Deanna hates it. And I don't know what she doesn't like about it. Usually she likes abstract strategies, but that one, for whatever reason, just didn't click for her. She didn't enjoy it. So I had never gotten to deep dive it. Like I, I really dig the game, but it's mainly a two-player game. And the person I play two-player games with is sitting over there. So, <laughs> All right, before we get to another question, is Deanna decide what game she is yet? Oh, I didn't think I was still on the hot seat for that one. <laughs> <laughs> we were giving you some time all right we're going to do one more i think i don't know how many questions we've answered this is going to be hard to seo <laughs> uh, we got some good deep talks about a few things and then some things that i'm not going to bother seoing like what game are you <laughs> uh do we have anything that's good okay well let's, let's there let's was do... something i saw in the chat and I'm, i lost oh, it did now. i miss one do I need a digital camera? So yeah, so May is in the chat and said, playing games and drinking and taking photos of games. Nothing like getting film developed and trying to figure out why I felt the need to drunkenly take photos of dice. So, so many photos of dice. <laughs> yeah, the days before cell phone cameras. Yep. So uh, Jeff's knowing if I played Dominion, there are certain combination of cards I won't play. And I'll get it. That's what it was. Someone said something about if you solve the game. Yeah, if you have solved the game, it's not fun to win anymore with that solution. So uh, yeah, the, the question was, if you find a dominant strategy, I trounce someone and then I purposely never use it again. So no, if you've solved the before. game, yeah. it's not fun to win anymore with that solution. So I, I I, the thing game. is a good game, a game that you can deep dive can't be solved. Right. right, Like Catan, there's no winning strategy. It's very much based on what the other players do. Like, yes, there are certain strategies that work really well, but there are counters to all of those. Okay. And yes, Deanna's in particular strategy will tend to win any tournament she enters because people don't know to stop it. But if you know to stop it, you can stop it. And there are other strategies that technically could work better if she doesn't stop them. And that's a good game. It's that interplay knowing the other players you're playing with. And if you don't, man, playing Catan in a tournament is hard. Because you don't know what the other players are doing. Now, most of the tournaments you enter tend to have casual players. And that's where it's like, all right, no problem. I should be able to win this. Unless you get someone at the table who decides to do that. Well, no trading with Mo for the rest of the game. And then you're like, well, I can't win because the table decided I can't win. Right. And that's king making. And some people hate it. Some people don't mind it and whatever. But that's an aspect of it. But I think like Puerto Rico, everyone's told me Puerto Rico solved. I still don't see it myself, but I never deep dive that game to that level. And no, I've never Googled what that strategy is. All I know in that is that it's very much like blackjack, where depending on where you're sitting at the table, you're supposed to do certain things. And if you don't, you hand the game to the player on your left or right. I don't remember what it is. Every time I sat down at a table and someone said that to me, that player didn't win or I won. Like it's either I won or someone else that shouldn't have won one and then they still blame it on me because i didn't do the thing like i 
I don't know. So supposedly that's solved. And then again, the newest edition actually comes with the new buildings and that supposedly fixes that strategy. Um, people have told me that there's a winning strategy for Princess of Florence. Um, tonight, again, we're going to go to tonight's review. I think I found a loophole. I'm not positive, but we chose not to use it. Like we sat there and went, this isn't thematic. It doesn't really make sense. So I think we're going we're gonna to not use this strategy, but I still think it's something that breaks the game, which we'll get to in the review segment. But it's honest. definitely something. Yeah, for, for me, I mean, if there's a, this game, this is going to win the th game, I'm probably not going to play that game anymore. I, I just, why? It's not a game anymore. It's a, it's a puzzle. Yeah, it's a right? solved puzzle. It's, it, you know, puzzles, puzzles with, with solutions are, you know, you don't want to do this crossword after someone has lightly erased all the answers already. You know, it's, yeah. there's no fun there. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, I'll admit, like, a, there's a couple games, I'm, I can't think of any, maybe Deanna can that we own where we basically don't play them anymore because of that, that there's, there's certain ways to play that just seem better. Yep. All right. Oh, Descent Journeys in the Dark. That was a play it all the time game. I like Hive. Hive's a good game. Hive tournament would be rough. I'm really good at Hive, but <laughs> I don't know if I'd be good enough for a, <laughs> for a tournament. Do we have anything light to answer? Because we're still a little short on time. We haven't even spent an hour talking here. All right. Well, well sure. Let's. Uh, Jeff's got another one here that's a, that I think is something really. Right? That that one I don't think is all that light. No. <laughs> no, okay. I'm thinking like just something silly. Do we have anything silly? Someone's asked. Uh... Just to kill a few more minutes. Yeah, Deanna's noting she's a Terra Mystic a pro at this point for the number of <laughs> games she's played. Uh... I still think I did really well with the bridge people, but it didn't do it for me. Yeah, you know it happens. Yes, it's That's my okay. fault. We don't have Canadian merch. I need to set the time <laughs> aside to do a video video call with someone ah, okay. that may produce our stuff, but I need to be feeling better to do that. Right. Uh, Machi Koro, I did not like much. If Roger had turned into the last couple shows, I, I <laughs> talked about it in the um, games we played. Just did not impress me. Well, not compared to some other games that do things similar. So yeah, Roger, add to your list, play Space Base with Mo, and then we'll see if you still like Machi Koro. <laughs> uh, one thing Dee's noting is uh, when she plays Terra Mystica, she refuses to play certain races, and I'm guessing Witches is probably one of them, uh, because those are the beginner races, right? Those are designed yep. to be Yeah, the Witches, the weight. Desert Nomads, and the Darklings, is it? Um, something like that. But yeah, so yeah. There, are, there are beginner races that are designed to be a little easier to play and have a little extra advantage so that, you know, the people who've been playing a while can help, can hop on and play the giants. Whereas the new player can get the witches and, and have a little right. easier time and yeah. not get quite as frustrated as quickly. Oh, the witches are just ridiculous. In yeah, it's, uh, I, 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 there's gotta be a counter to them and I haven't figured out what it was. See Machi Koro, the original game has a dominant strategy, but it's fixed with Harbor. And if you pick up Bright Lights, Big City, which is the addition I have, it's also fixed in that. Bright Lights, Big City is a combination of the best of the expansions put together. And now the Machi Koro 5th edition anniversary edition is now out. That also fixes that dominant strategy. What I didn't like in Machi Koro is it was, it was too much take that and it was too much passing around to resources. And it was just frustrating. It's like, I can build it. No, you took all my money. Hey, look, I can build. Oh, you took all my money. Oh, look, well, I might as well just build this crappy stuff. So at least you don't steal my money. And then you end up with this table full of stuff and it gets convoluted. I was not a big fan of that one. It's interesting. There are a lot of uh, Machikoro strategy guides out there. It's yes. like Monopoly, right? It's one of those games where everyone has their ways to better to to the base the game, game did often. have a broken strategy that was pretty well documented by a bunch of gamers which is why i stayed away from it for so long right so all right here's our last question uh first i'll note tech finally got to play space base and his daughter loved it too that's awesome space base is really good i'm still upset like, I really good <laughs> i i am really look i've only played a two player i am really looking playing that with more i still don't think it replaces valeria card kingdoms well, we have a answer from D for our "What type of game are you?" episode. D is Seafall. Okay, it's a legacy game with a which way book with rules that change and develop in complexity the longer you know her. And Seafall, because it's not popular, most people overlook it, and it ends up in the discount bin. <laughs> the discount bin part's a little rough. <laughs> well, we were pretty rough on both of yeah, ours as well. That's so true. There we go. The rest, no, totally fair. I, I like it. 
a text pointing out that he had three players in his uh, space base. So he's played. Nice. I, I assume it's got to be better because just more things would happen on the off turn. Well, we had with two players. It's just back and forth. Even went through the rules. <laughs> Somehow Very we close. skipped playing it. I don't know. Well, the one time we like it was there on the table I buried. Not, not that Letter Jam was bad. It's yeah. just we didn't see the game. It wasn't in front of our face. Yep. All right. Well, that's all for our rainy day AMA. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop.